and more with happiness and the psychology of happiness, which can only be learned through self-mastery and self-knowledge, meditation, prayer, study. In Judaism, there's no real differentiation between study and prayer. It's when you study, you're also praying intellectually at the same time, and vice versa. When you do deep meditation, you're also studying the emptiness of consciousness and the divine source of consciousness, which is the one, the Allah. Um, but no, ignorance doesn't like any of that. So, so scrub RE, scrub philosophy off the curriculum. Everybody should be just like wired in, you know, have chips in your brain, like robots, plugged in 24-7, um, no kind of time to think about morality and right and wrong, just press the button when directed on the screen type of thing. Um, well, that leads to zombies that will do drone warfare and, and send missiles onto weddings of Sufis in Afghanistan and having fun just because somebody tells them to. Um, <clears throat> so... I think the, f the fight back is for a humane education, which is what the Dalai Lama is calling for. And I'm helping uh, Jain colleagues in India organize another conference on education. You know, we're inviting them to take part, which is how we can reform the global approach and thinking about education so that morality and ethics, indeed spirituality, are put at the core of education, which is how it always used to be. Technology is brilliant. I love it. You know, I use it all the time. But it should be the servant of spirit and not the other way around. <clears throat> then there's um, a kind of another cause of Brexit is ignorance caused by this inflation, this desire for neo-imperialism. Oh, we'll prove to the world we're great again. Britain used to own, like, the biggest empire the world had ever known. Um, we're going to prove we can go it alone. We don't need Europe. That kind of arrogance of neo-imperialism well it's a it's a counter charge because i think britain's english maybe particularly in some you know endangered regions where there's not much employment and so on not much hope in the society they've they've lost their way a bit and, and turned to racism and now they've got anti-europe as a kind of new racial hatred um and it's interesting that anti-Semitic um, attacks have increased and anti-Islamic attacks have increased in this climate of anti-Europeanism, which is really anti-cosmopolitanism, anti-globalism, um, anti-what um, I call left-wing, you know, esotericism. And it's so the what they're trying to do is say, well, we're great, we're Great Britain, we don't need any, you know. Um, anything apart from ourselves, we are the great power. But this is what in psychology is called like bipolarity. You move from a depression to then a megalomania. You then become, you know, Great Britain, hooray, hooray. <clears throat> well, it's just ridiculous flag-waving nonsense. The, the Brexit uh, people like Boris Johnson, Dominic Cummings, and, and uh, Rhys Mogg embody. I mean, I think they literally have a kind of pathology, which is like a bipolar megalomania. They think they're going to um, just sail into some new imperial fantasy. The real world doesn't work like that. I've travelled around the world. I know that, that the days of that, that British Empire are over, and thank God, you know, because it was racist, it, was, it wasn't, uh, you know, the best of, of empires. It was based partly on slavery, and, you know, it had many good things, but it also had a sting in its tail. And so, thank you, we don't want it to come back. What we want instead, I would argue, is <clears throat> the best elements of British culture and civilization. Um, you know, the, the, the humane intellectual activity that, that British uh, savants have tried to do um, can play its part in, in, in a global peace culture as part of a wider European project. Because, you know, this is something the French, the British, the Germans, we all need to do this together, to think through how Europe can be a force of peace in the world and justice. Um, <clears throat> so that, that neo-imperialist, um, flag-waving, Brexiteer extremist thing, um, weirdly it's also been adopted by some actual immigrant people like Priti Patel and others, who, who then latch on to that as a kind of good career bandwagon to join. You get elevated to the Tory party senior echelons. Um, 
But actually, that's very impolite and, and also based on sheer ignorance of the complexity of the British Isles and our culture. So it's complete ignorance about the Irish situation. Um, Pretty Patel has made some horrendous comments about that. Complete ignorance about the Scottish situation. Anyone that is actually, actually, you know, from people who've lived and worked and suffered and loved and fought in Britain for centuries, whose families are, you know, indigenous, will know that uh, we belong inside the European Union and that um, we would leave it at our peril. Um, it's a bit like the old Irish that, that were adopted and became part of Irish culture. So the old European tradition, also many Brits in Europe, um, this is why we're jumping up and down, shouting the alarm. Um, <clears throat> and this is because the, the entire health of the continent and our country is at stake. We love Britain, we love Scotland, England, Wales, Ireland, North and South, France, every part, you know, Brittany, Germany, etc., and the European Union, although it's imperfect, seems to me to be a pretty good overall structure for, for keeping that peace together. Um, I was talking about left-wing esotericism. I mean, I should have mentioned maybe two names that came up in the conference down south were Picasso, who loved the Pyrenees, and who painted the Dove of Peace. He painted Guernica. He painted the Charnel House. These were political paintings. Picasso fought and struggled for a world which would be beyond nationalism and fascism. That's why he joined the Communist Party. He became their artist, so to speak, based in Paris. My mother used to love Picasso and took me to his museum in the Pyrenees. He went to Serret, which is a little town in the Pyrenees region. Um, and it's very interesting that his, his son married a woman called Patrice, Chaplin, who is now a writer, full-time writer and playwright, and she has come out with a whole bunch of very interesting books recently, um, following on from the Holy Blood and Holy Grail traditions. She thinks she's found the source of all those legends. It's not Ren Le Chateau at all. Sonia was having an affair with someone in Girona from the Kabbalistic lineages, and Sonia was initiated into the Kabbalah, and there were practices they were doing, which dated back to the time of Nachmanides and before, back to the original Kabbalistic traditions. And the mystery of Ren Le Chateau, according to Patrice Chaplin, is actually the mystery of Girona and the Kabbalah. And that, um, uh, you know, her work is absolutely fascinating. I hope she'll speak at our conference next year. But she represents that, what I call that left esotericism. Um, and also... Um, Charlie Chaplin, who was, it's her son that she married, he was another lefty esotericist who in his films, his tramp character, captured the public imagination in the 30s during the Great Depression because he was every man. He was the down at heels tramp with the baggy trousers and no money in his pocket, who nevertheless kept his sense of humour. He stands for us all. Um... And Chaplin made, you know, The Great Dictator, a political film against, against fascism, against Hitler, using satire. And he made a film against McCarthy, who was trying to witch-hunt communists and, and anyone that was left of Genghis Khan out of American public life. Um, Chaplin made a film against that. And he was himself hauled up before the Congress Un-American Activities Committee, um, and accused of being a communist and so on. He refused to answer them um, and eventually left America in disgust and went to live in Switzerland where there's a museum dedicated to his memory in the village he lived in in Switzerland. Um, but Chaplin was too big a thinker for that petty nationalism that McCarthy stood for. Well, the Brexit lot are the McCarthys of our era. They're anti-European, anti-cosmopolitan, anti-intellectual and um, anti-liberal. You know, the, the, um, the thing they all hate is liberalism. They spit it out like a swear word. Well, I'm sorry, I'm with Voltaire and Montesquieu and Jeremy Bentham and John Locke and the liberal enlightenment. I'm with Kant and I'm with Hegel and the entire mainstream of European liberal democratic philosophical thought, um, <clears throat> of which Chaplin, Picasso and all these are also part. And so in his own way was Marx. People don't realise that. We've been brainwashed into thinking Marx was evil, but if you actually read his text, I'm doing a detailed commentary on, on 
Das Kapital at the moment, you can listen to it online, you discover that he was actually a genius looking at how capital was, was imprisoning people um, and was, was making their lives misery. And he wasn't so good at what we could do about that. I mean, his, 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 um, you know, his solutions weren't very good, but his findings are important scientifically. Okay, another form of ignorance. Well, is is um, <clears throat> is by a small elite group that come together to manipulate the masses. They're able now to do this through data control, information control, censorship. Um, knowledge, information, is now the new commodity. We live in a knowledge society. About 10, 20 years ago, everyone was saying this, the knowledge revolution. What we failed to see coming was that it would, it would be then hijacked by certain class interests. We didn't read our marks properly. We didn't realise that man, that since information is the new wealth, then there would be this attempt by the elite classes to hijack knowledge and then repackage it as information for sale, which you pay through the nose for, um, and is distorted and changed. So you buy your Daily Telegraph or whatever, and it's just packaged propaganda for the elite capitalist classes that want to destroy Europe and enable their offshore banking interests to survive. Um, so there's, there's a problem, and the people doing it don't realise what they're doing. It's like when Christ on the cross said, to forgive them, Father, they don't know what they're doing. I mean, I repeat those words. We have to... Um, we have to somehow try and educate these people before they bring this planet down, which is the logical implications of where we're headed with if we go on in this, in this manipulative secrecy path. Um, you know, this planet is not going to survive. This planet will survive as a freedom project, uh, or it won't survive. And my job as a, a druid and a seer and a philosopher of peace is to sound the alarm here. Um, so... There's also the ignorance of the power elites saying that, well, seizing democracy and, and control of the parliamentary constitution. I didn't think I'd live to see this in my lifetime. It's unbelievable. When I grew up in Britain, Parliament seemed like a good place with fair and decent people. And if you were caught out and lied, you resign. And, and uh, I remember the days of Harold Wilson and, you know, on the left and Edward Heath on the right, but they were, they, they were kind of respectful of each other. The parliamentary debates were never personal and, and um, you know, corrosive. We've, we've, we've entered a nightmare world where these ignorant, manipulative elites have literally hijacked and captured Parliament. I would say Dominic Cummings is one of their chief architects, and he has now been found in contempt of Parliament. Well, I'd, I think parliamentarians need to get a bit of some teeth, and I think that man should be hauled back before Parliament and um, should be, you know, should be examined. He refused to go to Parliament. Now he's part of the elite Johnson cabinet that is trying to buy, hijack Parliament and take the UK out of the European Union um, on Halloween, like some kind of nightmare. Um, and... He thinks he can get away with it. Well, my friends in Parliament, I did chair 33 meetings in Parliament on peace and ethics, and I'd be happy to, you know, advise on doing future meetings. But there's no point, is there, really, if Parliament is just bypassed by these, um, these negative and, and manipulative elites. Um, they have to be opposed. And behind Dominic Cummings, there's Farage and, and Boris Johnson and... Uh, Rees Mogg and so on, um, and so there's there's layer upon layer of ignorance there. I, I don't have time to even bother to to un, unpack it all. But if you look at the psychology of those key Brexiteers, there is a psychology of ignorance that that shapes up that can be explained and analysed. And I'm saying that scholars need to do that. We have to study this ignorance. Um, I've set up this Centre for Bromain Studies here in France and, and the UK, and, you know, these weekly lectures are just part of the work. I'm about to publish a book on all this. So, yes, there's been an ignorance takeover of British democracy, um, which will lead to the death of Britain. You see, where ignorance rules, life dies, because life, the life force, is, comes from wisdom. And this is what all the wisdom traditions of humanity say, the Vedas, you know, the Hebrew 
Bible, the, the Christian Bible, where there's life, then there's light and there's love. And when ignorance comes, there comes darkness, destruction and, and, and death. The Scots and the Irish have enough gumption, enough life spirit to oppose Brexit with all their being. And, and no, they're just saying, if you stupid people in Westminster think you have the, well, if you have the ignorance to do Brexit, we will rejoin Europe because that's, that's the life force here. Um, and we stand up for love. Well, I will support them, you know, um, as a Brit living in France and loving Europe. Um, I want my country as a whole to remain. But if not, then I want as much of it as possible to remain as part of Europe. And um, I believe that we can still stop Brexit. I think enough parliamentarians realise this. The Liberal Democrats have just won a, an amazing election in um, Radnorshire and Brecon which is a part of Wales I know well, um, and love well. I trained as a religious studies teacher there. One of my intellectual heroes, Dr John Dee, was from Radnorshire region originally. And um, I've travelled all over there, you know, communing with, with the hills and, and spirit of Druidry. Um, Druidry simply means truth-seeing. It's what Dee was able to do. It's what those of us that are still standing in this crazy um, battle zone and trying to bring peace... We have a duty to still see that, that uh, power of love and, and um, that power of unity, which Dee was you know, um, standing for in his day and I'm standing for now, along with colleagues. Um, <clears throat> also, I want to end with a few other visionaries who I think support the work I'm doing. Um, because as an antidote against all this ignorance, I've listed the ignorance. If you want to know more detail, you have to read my book and the chapter on the critical epistemology of wisdom. Uh, sorry, of ignorance. Um, and, you know, I go into detail there. Each generation, we have, to, we have to renew the cry for the right to be wise. To dare to be wise, as Kant said. You know, it's not something that the elites like you to do or relinquish gladly. It's hard to study, it's hard to do a degree, it's hard work to get a PhD, it's hard to battle forces that will block your own development and evolution. Um, you know, when she was a little girl, my mother had to walk seven miles a day to get the train to get to Skipton Grammar School in Yorkshire and back. Um, my colleague in India, Dr. S. L. Gandhi, when he went to school, he had to walk, you know, many miles to get to the school and back. <laughs> when I lived in Canada, um, you know, I was walking back and forth up a mountain in freezing snow with, with philosophy books in my satchel, um, you know, 30 below zero. Um, you have to struggle to get wisdom because the elites don't actually want that. And each generation, they want simply their own power and self-advancement. Um, that's what Nero wanted. That's what Caligula wanted. In the days of the Roman Empire in its darkest, they were fabulously wealthy, fabulously powerful. Um, and they were misusing that power. They were trying to hijack and usurp knowledge for their own elite control. And that's why Christ appeared as an antidote in his day to that negative misuse of power. Um, and you know, extraordinary courage that man had to stand up against the forces of the Roman Empire, and to triumph over it. That's what we've just been in the Pyrenees celebrating, the, the mystery of Mary Magdalene and the resurrection, if you want. And that's what I want from Brexit. Um, I want a resurrection. I want Remain to happen. I want to quote um, a couple of things. Today is the birthday of Shelley. Now, Shelley was a great poet. I love Shelley. He was a great influence on my, my younger life, um, and still is to some extent. Um, when I was studying English at Brighton Grammar School back in the 60s, our English teacher, Jack Smithies, and I had a kind of secret love of poetry, and I was writing poetry by then. And I was producing quite good kind of romantic imitations of Shelley. <laughs> and uh, he would, you know, he would comment on them and so on. But it was more than that. As I grew older, I realised Shelley wasn't just a poet. He was a bard. He was a freedom fighter. He was a druid and a sage. And he spent time living in Wales. Um, he loved Wales. 
And then he went to Italy, and he lived in Italy with his wife, Mary Shelley. And he believed in freedom. He was on what I call the left esoteric uh, channel. And he was horrified in 1819 when the Battle of Peterloo happened in Manchester. And dragoons shot down a whole bunch of just protesting, starving workers, many of whom had just left the army. They had nothing. And instead of sharing out the wealth of society, the response of the establishment was to send in dragoons and shoot and kill loads. And so Shelley wrote this poem, The Mask of Anarchy, written on the occasion of the massacre at Manchester. I'm going to read the beginning and ending. And his wife, Mary Shelley, wrote that he wrote this um, you know, at, at that time. As I lay asleep in Italy, there came a voice from over the sea. And with great power, it forth led me to walk in the visions of poesy. I met murder on the way. He had a mask like Castlereagh. Very smooth, he looked, yet grim. Seven bloodhounds followed him. All were fat, and while they might be an admirable plight, for one by one and two by two he tossed them human hearts to chew, from which his wide cloak he drew. Next came fraud, and he had on, like Eldon, an ermine gown. His big tears, for he wept well, turned to millstones as they fell. And the little children who round his feet played to and fro, thinking every tear a gem, had their brains knocked out by them. Clothed with the Bible as with light, and the shadows of the night, like Sidworth next, hypocrisy on a crocodile rode by. And many more destructions played in this ghastly masquerade, all disguised, even to the eyes, like bishops, lawyers, peers, or spies. Last came anarchy. He rode on a white horse, splashed with blood. He was pale, even to the lips, like death in the apocalypse. I'm not going to read the whole poem, you know, read it. It's a masterpiece. And it's a lament for the liberal, true traditions of, of British society, which have been hijacked in their day by these demonic forces, which he poetically, um, you know, um, castigates. And the poem ends, he says that we will survive this, we will... The forces that have done Peterloo, Peterloo, to me, are exactly the same forces that have done Brexit. Make no mistake about it, it's just, you know, fast forward a couple of hundred years. Um, but Shelley said, no, we will triumph over them through our wisdom, through our love of beauty, through our love of truth. And he was a great lover of Italy, he was a great lover of Europe. Um, He'd be writing poetry against Brexit, I assure you. Um, so his last verse in this magnificent poem is, Rise like lions after slumber in unvanquishable number. Shake your chains to earth like dew, which in sleep had fallen on you. Ye are many, they are few. Well, thank you, Shelley. You know, we are many. The Bremainers, the people that have seen through the lies of Brexit, we are many. The trouble is that the media and the information, the BBC, the control of this is in the hands of the few, the very few. So this is why we need to use things like the internet and, and you know, good old-fashioned networking. Um, and that's what the Lib Dems are trying to do. That's how they won the Radnisher by-election. Bless them. And that's how... We must vote out this corrupt, um, you know, government by demons um, <clears throat> at the earliest possible opportunity. And um, 
all the Remain parties, now including Labour, need to come together and, and agree a common strategy for that. Um, I also want to quote a po poem, brief poem from Byron, who was a friend of Shelley's, and another great Europhile. Um, he was a slightly different kind of poet to Shelley, but they were both passionate Europhiles because they knew that English literature is part of European literature. Um, and we borrowed ideas, themes, forms of verse. Even the very language we speak, English, is a European language. It came from the Anglo-Saxons who, who crossed the seas, you know, 400 AD-ish. And um, the Druid poems of Taliesin and Emergen of Ireland and Wales, again, it's a European language that came from Europe as a whole, um, so, for us to leave Europe is, is like my left arm saying, I want to leave the body. We are one body here. Anyway, Byron knew this, and he wrote magnificent poems based around his experiences and his journeys in, in Europe. He wrote Child Harold's Pilgrimage, which is all around uh, the hero travelling around Europe. He comes at one point to the Alps. <clears throat> Once more upon the woody Apennine, the infant Alps, which, had I not before gazed on their mighty appearance, where the pine sits on more shaggy summits, and where roar the thundering lawwine, might be worshipped more. But I have seen the soaring Jungfrau rear her never-trodden snow, and seen the hoar glaciers of bleak Mont Blanc, both far and near, and in Kimari heard the thunder hills of fear. Dot, 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 you know, great stuff. Um, I just wanted to, to include that because it's a beautiful verse and it shows a tiny glimpse of Byron's love of Europe. But in the Druid traditions of Europe, which I'm writing a book about, um, and including, you know, Britain, England, Scotland, Wales, Ireland, the Druid traditions of the ancient world, they found very, very ancient temples and, and sites. Archaeology has done a lot of work on Druidry from the Halstatt period and the tumulus culture of ancient proto halstatt and then the Latin period. So we're talking thousands of years before Christianity and before the Romans conquered Gaul. And in the High Alps, the Druids used to say that the peaks were dedicated to Jupiter Poenus, this is in the Gallo-Roman time, because Switzerland, the Helvetii tribe of, of Celts, had accepted the Romans. The Romans technically ruled the place, but the Celts still carried on doing their, their life force. And there was a deal done religiously between the Roman gods, the pagan pantheon, and the Celtic gods. So um, Tyrannus, who was the, the Gallic Druid god of the Supreme, was identified with with Jupiter, um, and other gods and goddesses were married up, so you had a kind of Celtic Roman um, merging going on. A bit like happened in Tibet, where you had Buddhist stroke Bon merging, which gave us tantric iconography. It was the same in Europe. And Jupiter Poenus um, means the Jupiter of the summit, the Jupiter of the highest mountain. Um, I've just been down to Bugarach, which is one of the most sacred mountains of Europe. It's kind of like the Arunachala of Europe, um, a sacred mountain for Shiva in India, which I've been to, where Sri Ramana Maharshi lived. And Bugarach would have been dedicated to Jupiter Poenus. Um, Poenus is, is meaning the head, the summit, as in Pen, as in Pentonville in Islington, where I used to live, in the Pennines. It was a, a word meaning the head, as in Pendragon, the head dragon, Arthur Pendragon, Uther Pendragon. So Pen is the head. So Jupiter of the summits is the supreme god. The, there was a temple on St. Bernard's Pass. Archaeologists have found a, a temple to Jupiter to Poenus on the summit of that, that mountain uh, in, in Italy. Uh, sorry, between the, the, the Swiss and Italian borders. And, um, yeah, it's just lovely to think of Byron wandering about there and writing these great poems. And he was like a latter-day bard. 
in love with, with language and poesy, as was Shelley and, of course, Keats, who were my three heroes as a young, young poet. The other thing I want to say about Byron is he felt so deeply about his love of Europe that he gave himself to help the War of Greek Independence. You know, um, he went and helped with their, their struggle against the Ottoman Empire, which brought independence for Greece. And he was such a Hellenophile that he believed that there comes a time when you have to sort of be heroic to support them. Um, one of my friends, who was a Conservative MP, C.M. Woodhouse, um, who came and spoke at the Philosophy Society I ran at the School of Oriental, sorry, Slavonic and East European Studies at the University of London, he had written a book about Gemistus Plethon, who was another great Hellenophile, just before the Ottomans captured Constantinople. Plethon had said that, that Greece will survive as long as it remembers its ancient deities, as long as it honours Zeus and, and, and Hera and Aphrodite and Artemis, all will be well. And even if it's just a few who, who retain that knowledge of ancient wisdom, they may be Christians outwardly, it doesn't matter, but in their hearts they must keep this ancient faith alive. And Plethon taught that to the Italians of Florence. He came to give lectures on the Renaissance. And that kick-started the Italian Renaissance. He was the unsung hero of the Renaissance. He himself had a Jewish teacher called Eliseus, who was a very wise Kabbalist in Istanbul, um, who was then killed by the Turk fanatics um, for heresy, so-called. But Plethon was a great man, and my friend uh, C.M. Woodhouse, this great European historian and philosopher, as well as a Conservative MP, he'd written a whole book about him, so he came and gave a lecture. Now, you see, that's the old-school Conservative MP. People like C.M. Woodhouse, long dead, they simply don't make them anymore. The, these are the actual intellectuals who are also Conservatives. I suppose Dominic Grieve and his friends and colleagues... Kenneth Clark to some extent, but Dominic Grieve, these are proper conservative intellectuals who are Europhiles and know why. C.M. Woodhouse himself helped the Greek resistance in World War II against the Nazis. An amazing man. Um, and that's where Byron, he was from that lineage. I mean, I know where he was brought up in Nottingham because I was head of school in Mansfield, head of uh, religious studies there. I used to drive past the abbey where... Um, Byron grew up as a, as a child every day on my way to work. Um, so, you know, for the sake of Byron, we have, to, we have to protect and preserve this wonderful thing called the European Union and our role in it. It's not the time to cut and run. Yes, Greece went through some terrible difficulties. That's why we should stay in and help, because they're our brothers and sisters. And if you have any, you know, spark of reverence or piety towards Zeus and Aphrodite and Athena, the goddess of wisdom, then we should be there working with them. That would be Byron's position from beyond the grave, and it's mine, <laughs> this side of the grave. Um, okay, so I want to end with <clears throat> the greatest of all Greek thinkers. As a philosopher, you know, I'm by definition a... Hellenist, and when I went to the World Congress of Philosophy in Athens in 2013, it was renewing my own covenant with, with, with the gods um, <clears throat> of wisdom and with, with, the, with Athena particularly, who was the guardian of that great city. And I went to the Acropolis and did my prayers as usual. Um, and I learned something very interesting actually, that, that Athena secretly had an affair with Prometheus. Um, that's not generally known. I discovered that through digging away in certain classical sources. Um, and that's why her father's use was so annoyed at, at um, Prometheus. It's the backstory because, and why he had him bound.